So Matt uh, asked that Matt asked that uh, we sort of give an overview of some of the newer areas of the enzymes and such involved in drug metabolism. I'm indeed uh, pleased to be able to present this talk and to uh, thank Matt for letting me come into his lab as a postdoc. Now that I've retired, I get to do real science again. Uh, and so I will cover what's discussed as phase one metabolism of environmental chemicals. And while some people may argue, whoops, ah, it goes back. No, that's, there, oh. you don't dare trust these at all. Oh, that's because of the mouse, okay. Uh, so while people may argue whether this is the correct nomenclature in a pharmacology course, uh, we'll discuss these in terms of phase one or oxidative reactions. David will talk a bit about phase two, and then of course our first speaker, uh, Angela, will talk about the transporters. So for oxygenated intermediates uh, that have toxicity as drugs, uh, the SIPs, cytochromes P450, play a major role in creating those entities, and Bob Roth uh, discussed this. And so I'll cover that. David will talk about the phase two enzymes and particularly focus on the acyl transferases. And one of the points why SIPs form, uh, why SIPs play such a major role in drug injury has to do with the fact that they form agents that interact chemically with DNA, RNA, but also protein act addicts. And so they actually can inactivate enzymes. In addition, they can form haptan-like molecules that have other properties that uh, lead on to the effects that we see with drug injury. So the SIPs are a heme thiolate monooxygenase. It means they have a heme group at their active site, and it's a heme thiolate because there's a fifth coordination position, sulfur, that coordinates with the heme. In humans, there are 58 genes, and so there's quite a diversity of them. They catalyze all sorts of monooxygenase reactions at carbon, carbon hydrogen, carbon carbon, nitrogen, sulfur, and phosphorus centers. All of those can result in fairly reactive chemical intermediates. To date, uh, many of them have been purified and their active sites characterized with regard to substrate specificity and molecular volume. And interestingly, those P450s that metabolize endogenous compounds appear to have very defined active sites and are not very plastic or not very accommodating of substrates. For those that metabolize drugs, the active sites are very amorphous or plastic, and they actually can assume the molecular volume of many different compounds. And in fact, in the case of the CYP3A, can actually bind multiple substrates, accounting for the positive heterotropic cooperativity that one can see kinetically. And one can also see drug-drug interactions when two different drugs bind in the active site of the, say, CYP3A, and can then change the ability of it, the CYP3A to catalyze reactions. So some drug reactions, interactions, have to do with those active sites. P450s metabolize both endogenous and exogenous compounds, drugs, as I've mentioned, but also steroids, fatty acids, and in the case of steroids and fatty acids, will almost invariably not have a major number of foreign chemicals as their intermediates, as their substrates. Uh, we heard a little bit about a question about what's known about the uh, expression and of these various enzymes in humans, and in fact, they're highly variable in amount within a, a age period. And in the case of pediatric patients, not a lot is known about the various levels of expression. So they can be highly variable. In the case of CYP3A4, the major P450 in our body, uh, there may be a 10 or 20 fold variation in the amount of P450 within each of our livers. 
The P450s are associated with, uh, it disappeared. <laughs> oh, there it is. Uh, it, it, P450s have been associated with reactive metabolite generation, and in particular, there's been a lot of information about the, uh, the CYP1A1, CYP1A2, and 2E making re chemically reactive intermediates. In addition, there's a number of polymorphisms or SNPs in these genes which account for big variations in ethnic differences between metabolism and individuals who are poor metabolizers and good metabolizers, and Dr. Hein will talk a bit about that. One of the interesting things in people interested in drug metabolism was the development of a human P450 pi, that is being able to show the various P450s that, uh, that's hard to point on that one, uh, various P450s, and you'll see that 3A4 is a major SIP in the intestine and still the largest uh, SIP in the liver. And so a lot of drugs in, with regard to drug metabolism have been phenotyped in this category. However, recently it was pointed out that the 28% of P450s that weren't included in that figure, actually the CYP4As account for a large number, a large amount of those unknown P450s. And interestingly, CYP4F has begun to play a role in drug metabolism because all of the new compounds that are, that are engineered not to be uh, metabolized by all the other P450s we're finding are now metabolized by CYP4F. And so in that literature, you're going to see you know, CYP4F you know, being involved in metabolism of new, new drugs and perhaps new toxicities. And so the CYPs are, are uh, re, uh, clearly known to be involved in acetaminophen toxicity, isoniazid, rifampicin, nitrofurantoin, which was discussed earlier oral hypoglycemics. There are a number of drug-drug interactions because of those large plastic active sites. And of course, we have begin to see a problem with complementary and alternative medicines causing those drug-drug interactions. For example, induction through the active component of St. John's warts, inactivation of P450s by the uh, furanocumarins that are in grapefruit juice that inhibit the P450s. And then, of course, just competition in the, for the active site. So how are they regulated? Well, they, as pointed out a bit by Bob Roth this morning, they're regula regulated by foreign chemicals, but also by endogenous uh, moieties like hormones, growth factors, cytokines, uh, and that affects the expression level. That may account for that wide variation, say, in CYP3A expression in our livers, that if you are, for example, taking something like St. John's wort, you may have induction, but you may have inactivation, and so there can be large variation within a human population. Those changes in regulations affect foreign compound metabolism, and of course, uh, in uh, metabolism of endogenous compounds. And uh, we're probably going to see more about that. The SIPs, the induction of SIPs uh, are hallmarked by low basal expression and variable induction. Induction is tissue specific. It's rapid within uh, by 16 hours, protein about one day. They're dose dependent. They're many times reversible. And they, res and they this induction uh, many times results in the metabolism of the inducer, and so the duration of expression changes tremendously from when you administer the compound to the induction phase and then the fall-off phase. And even in some cases, there's been examples where uh, inactivation of the P450s account for this loss of activity. Induction has demonstrated that, that uh, changes are affected by ER proliferation, uh, glucose metabolism can be altered. Uh, uh, several people like Wen Shi have demonstrated an interaction with intermediary metabolism in these receptors, and I think we're going to see more and more of that coming out. 
And this is simply a list of, in, of known inducers of P450s in man. Now, interestingly of late, a new function for the aryl hydrocarbon receptor, i.e. having an endogenous ligand, has been brought about. This is a receptor that normally, in the absence of a ligand like TCDD, is inactive. It's complexed in the cytoplasm. When a ligand like TCDD binds, this complex dissociates. The receptor goes into the nucleus, associates with a, a heterodimeric partner, activates a bunch of genes. And we begin to see that in, in addition to compounds like TCDD and PCBs, that some bacterial toxins or bacterial metabolites also function. These were ignored for many years because of their high dissociation constant, but it turns out that most likely in the presence of a wound or in the presence of a specialized infection that high levels of these materials, these bacterial metabolites, can occur to acti act activate the AH receptor. So for example, uh, in the case of Pseudomonas aeruginosa and several others, their bacterial metabolites regulate the AH receptor. So the green color you see in a wound is actually the formation of a pigment which is made from the metabolites that initially would be used to go into the aromatic amino acid pathways, but they get subverted to making pyrocyanins, which are redox active. The color of the green is from the cyanin, which is the green color, and upon reduction it becomes bleached. You don't see the color in the wound itself. There is some argument that these compounds also protect the Pseudomonas species from other bacteria so that there's a, a bacterial warfare that preserves a robust infection by the primary material. Um, in addition, intestinal metabolites from bacteria are, th are known or have been shown to activate the AHR, and they appear to regulate intestinal endothelial lymphocytes. And so, for example, with AH activity, the bacterial metabolites activate AH receptor, which mobilize or, or potentiate the function of these leukocytes and and cause a more regulated bacterial membrane, preventing the, uh, include the polysaccharides and such from entering the cell. In the absence of the AH receptor, then those materials can penetrate and go into the bloodstream. And in other areas, the AH receptor is being shown that through tryptophan metabolites like kynurenin, that they regulate the immune system and, and potentiate function of the T regulatory cells. The other set of P450s of importance are those which are part of the nuclear uh, receptor uh, superfamily, and particularly I'll point out PPARs, constitutive androstane receptor, and PXRs. Uh, in Matt's lab, there's a lot of interest in, in how these are regulated by PCBs, and I think we're going to find many more of these ex exogenous compounds and maybe even bacterial metabolites that may activate these receptors. Uh, so again, the, these receptors are activated by endogenous and exogenous compounds. Uh, in many regards, we assume them to be protective, but we know that there are drug-drug interactions. And of course, as I said earlier, they have other roles. Now there's also a set of a couple of other transcription factors that play a role in regulation, and I think Jose may cover some of this. With, back, with CYP2A5, it appears that this NRF2 transcription factor plays a role. And recently, Joyce Goldstein and I have published that, that AP1 regulation of the mem, uh, mirroring 2C29 is, uh, is uh, in addition to uh, CAR regulating and that, that these FOS-JUN interactions regulate them, and we had a paper just come out about 2C9 being regulated, and that's a major drug metabolizing P450, suggesting that not just phenobarbital and other compounds, but maybe 
these AP1 proteins play a role. So there's still a lot to be known about their expression, and that could account for this high variability of expression in, in individuals. So I thought that would be the salient things to talk about today with regard to the phase one since they're fairly new. So I will now turn it to David and let him talk about the phase two system. Thanks, Russ, and, and thanks, Matt, for organizing this symposium and allowing me to participate. I'm learning a lot. Um, as, uh, as Russ indicated, uh, my role is to now cover the phase two part of uh, hepatic metabolism. And in doing so, I hope to uh, provide some insights into pharmacogenetics um, and some examples where it's relevant for uh, hepatotoxicity. So, um, Phase two are the conjugation or synthetic reactions. And um, Russ alluded to the nomenclature uh, challenges. The reason for that is that phase two can occur first rather than before, uh, rather than after phase one. Um, and so many of us prefer uh, terms like conjugation or synthetic. Basically, they're defined that uh, an endogenous uh, cofactor will be added to the substrate. It can be a, a glucuronic acid, an acetyl group, glutathione, glycine, um, et cetera, and they're all catalyzed uh, by a transferase. And obviously I don't have enough time to talk about all of these, but I want to focus on uh, acetyl transferase because it's a personal interest of mine and we can um, provide some pharmacogenetic data that might be of interest. So one of the things about N-acetyl transferase is that it obviously it does catalyze the N-acetylation of amine groups, but what was not always appreciated but is now appreciated uh, in more recent years is following N-hydroxylation there can be a subsequent O-acetylation of the hydroxy group uh, to produce an acetoxy. This is a, a really good leaving group, highly unstable, generates aryl nitrenium ions that bind a nucleophile such as DNA, and if those addicts aren't uh, um, repaired, lead to mutagenesis. The same thing can be uh, shown for proteins. Um, and so what this means is that n transferase can be uh, a, a detoxification reaction, but it can also be an activation pathway. And for some of the uh, environmental chemicals that we uh, ec are exposed to, there are multiple amine groups. And so sometimes acetylation of one amine uh, is not detoxification because it actually makes the other amine more susceptible to oxidation. So this is the coding region, the, 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 uh, the, the, the open reading frame for the N-acetyl transferase 2 enzyme, the famous one that shows genetic polymorphism. There are other N-acetyl transferases, uh, N-acetyl transferase 1 being the other major one. But for uh, NAT2, um, this is the uh, open reading frame, and you can see uh, various spots where there are single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs. And these SNPs are inherited as uh, haplotypes or alleles. And so the, the NAT2 star 5B, for example, has these three SNPs. The NAT2 6A has these two SNPs, etc. And these alleles or haplotypes are more frequent in certain ethnic groups, which uh, sometimes leads to the differences between ethnic groups in drug metabolism or uh, toxicity from, from various environmental chemicals. So one of the things that we've uh, been very interested in doing is to characterize uh, anacetylation and oacetylation in human hepatocytes. And we have been using um, cryopreserved human hepatocytes for this uh, role. And what, what I'm showing here in the solid bars are uh, human cryopreserved hepatocytes that have been genotyped as homozygous rapid. So both of the haplotypes um, that make up the, the diplotype or genotype are 
uh, rapid acetylators, and then we have the homozygous slow acetylators in which both of the haplotypes or uh, alleles uh, have SNPs that reduce activity. And then we have the heterozygotes, which have uh, a rapid haplotype and a, and a slow haplotype. And what's very striking is you see a gene dose response relationship in these human hepatocytes for substrates such as sulfamethazine that are highly selective for that NAT2 enzyme. For substrates like 4-aminobiphenyl, which aren't as selective for NAT2, in other words, they are also acetylated by NAT1, um, you still see a, a, a robust gene dose response, but the magnitude is not as great. And then for other substrates, such as paraminobenzoic acid, which are clearly selective for NAT1, uh, you don't see the relationship. And so you can, you can look at individual uh, hepatocyte samples. These are each dot represents an individual patient uh, cryopreserved hepatocyte. You can see there can be a fairly widespread, but when you take the means, there's, a, there's this clear gene dose response relationship between rapid, intermediate, and slow. And one of the things that we were very interested then is seeing if this relationship also applied for the O acetylation of uh, certain uh, anhydroxylated metabolites of environmental or dietary carcinogens. And um, these are all significantly different. Uh, the magnitude of these differences reflect um, whether or not, uh, reflect how selective they are for NAT2 versus NAT1, but we still see that this acetylation polymorphism applies to the O acetylation reaction as well as the N acetylation. And so then other things we can do, we, we can stratify all the samples uh, based on a single SNP and we can look at the effect of each SNP on the N acetylation of say sulfamethazine and all of the SNPs uh, show this gene dose response relationship. Um, uh, for example, with 341, if you have uh, two copies of the C, you're very low. If you have two copies of the T, you're very high. If you're C and T, you're intermediate. And this is the same data, again, showing each individual sample for each individual SNP. And, and you can see the spread in the data, and you can see the gene dose response relationship that occurs. And so then you can, um, you, you can uh, stratify the data by individual genotype or certain collections of genotypes. So these are all the homozygous rapid genotypes and you get a very high activity. These are all the heterozygous uh, genotypes and you get an intermediate level of activity and these are the homozygous slow genotypes and you get a much lower level of activity. If you look closely here, you'll see that um, there is actually some variation within the slow acetylator genotype, and a lot of what we focused on recently is this heterogeneity within the slow acetylator phenotype. In other words, the risk can differ depending on whether you're one slow acetylator status or another slow acetylator status. Um, all of those studies I've shown you so far are in vitro. Uh, we can also uh, do these studies in situ in these cryopreserved hepatocytes. Uh, in this case, we're looking at isoniazid at two different concentrations. And um, again, we see a, a really nice gene dose response uh, between homozygous rapid intermediate and homozygous slow acetylators for metabolism of isoniazid uh, in situ. And this is just one of a number of slides where we've begun to look at genetic heter heterogeneity within the slow acetylator phenotype. So these are both slow acetylator uh, genotypes. And this is in situ. We're looking at sulfamethazine. And uh, clearly, this particular, slow, this particular slow acetylator has a higher rate than this one does, significantly at different concentrations. So um, the, the other part of this symposium is dealing with uh, environmental chemicals. So one environmental chemical I'd like to talk about is methylene dianalin. Uh, it's, uh, it has a lot of occupational um, uh, uses, and it also has had environmental exposures 
um, through the diet. There was a famous uh, case in England. Um, it is known to be hepatotoxic in various uh, uh, models such as rats and dogs and in man these people who were exposed got hepatotoxicity. Uh, it also in mice and rats can lead to tumor development and it is thought to be potentially carcinogenic in humans. So th this is, a, this is a, a, a metabolic scheme for methylene dianalin metabolism. Uh, it doesn't include everything, it's just focusing on some things that I want to focus on. So this is dianalin, so there are two amine groups, both of which can be subject to N-acetylation, so you can N-acetylate one, then N-acetylate the other one. Um, or you can hydroxylate one of them and then conjugate it with other phase two enzymes, uh, such as sulfation or glucuronidation. Uh, you can O-acetylate those hydroxies to produce the acetoxy. Um, and so um, N-acetylation could be detox, but it could be activation through O-acetylation or it could be activation by N-acetylating one amine and making the other amine um, more readily susceptible to oxidation, which has been shown with some aromatic amine dyes. So anyway, we thought that N-acetylation genetics might influence methylene dianalin hepatotoxicity. And um, we've tested all the various uh, NAT2 alizymes um, in, that are recombinantly expressed, uh, I think, this time in bacteria. And the, the slow acetylators have low activity and the rapid acetylators have high activity. And then going to the human cryopreserved hepatocytes, um, these are the homozygous rapid, these are the homozygous slow, these are the intermediate. Again, you see a clear gene dose response. It kind of asks you to make a mental note of this magnitude difference between rapid and slow in human hepatocytes. Because then we went to a rat model, um, and this is the difference between rapid acetylator rats and slow acetylator rats for uh, methylene dianalin uh, N-acetylation. Uh, the difference is, is less than what I showed you in human, uh, although relatively in the same ballpark. The reason that um, the magnitude is not huge is because it's N-acetylated by both the NAT1 and the NAT2. So if you look at the rapid NAT2 versus the slow NAT2, there's a huge difference. But of course, it's also acetylated by NAT1, which contributes in the slow acetylator. So we're seeing a difference here that's not unlike what you would see in humans. So we hope to test whether uh, an acetylator polymorphism affected uh, methylene dianalin hepatotoxicity in rapid and slow acetylator rats. This is a study we did with our colleague Gavin Arteel here at UofL. Um, when we administered a single dose of methylene dianalin to the rats, we saw greater levels of plasma uh, enzymes indicative of liver toxicity in rapid acetylators than in slow, and we looked at the histology, the necrosis was greater in rapid than slow as well. So with that, I hope to give you a little bit of a feel for the um, phase two enzymes and how they might be applicable to liver metabolism and liver toxicity. I thank you very much for your attention and Russ and I will be happy to answer questions about either of our presentations. Thank you very much. I think we have time for maybe one uh, question, one or two questions for Russ and David before we move on to the next uh, talk. Any? Yes, go ahead. Yes, David. So if you have, there's this massive array of chlorinated or other halogenated hypercarbons that can just basically are mimics to many of these substrates. Do any of those just go in and park on the active sites of these, of these enzymes? And, and so they're basically long residence times in the liver? I could not answer that question. I will tell you that we have looked at a number of the chlorinated uh, 
amines and di diamines, and they are substrates for these NAT1 and NAT2, and we've looked at mutagenesis and other indices in our cellular systems with these compounds. Yes? Small question. Um, there are a lot of products in the market with uh, nano compounds. Is there any interest in these nano compounds causing liver injury? You know, sunscreen, everything has nanoparticles right now. <laughs> Who wants to eat? Yeah. <laughs> I'll let you take a, your turn. <laughs> Having been on a couple of the drug metabolism editorial boards, yes, there are papers coming in about that. Some of them are getting published. Uh, it's hard to tell if there's a, a, right now there's no compelling evidence that they have an effect, but that doesn't mean that something special will come out. But it's with regard to uh, the question Dean asked, uh, with the chlorinated bi biphenyl compounds, uh, it does raise the question is if they are ligands for the CAR or PXR, and you have a patient who's, say, in a fasting state, you may have a problem with uh, drug dosage, you know, prescription of drugs and some potential drug-drug interactions. So I think that, is, that hasn't been demonstrated, but it could be a problem. Quick comment, Bob. Does Apparently, phenol get N-oxidized and then subsequently acetylated through a reactive intermediate? I can answer the first part. It gets N-oxidized. <laughs> yeah, because way back in the, in the 70s, that was an active substrate looking at N-hydroxylation by P450s. And, and I assume it gets acetylated? It gets acetylated uh, relative to its oxidation. Um, many of the cosmetic companies have large interest in that, and um, some of the data I can't disclose, but um, it's an active area of interest. Well, thank you uh, for both speakers. Oh.